of the Director of Faculty of the German General and Staff Officer College, um, studies in mechanical engineering, MBA studies, so we're very excited to hear your presentation today on Open Up or Close Down, Why Openness Might Be the Key Factor to Future Success. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my presentation and first I want to thank you for the kind introduction, Professor Kalao, thank you very much for the chance and opportunity being here, attending that conference and also presenting some of our ideas and findings at our institute. So quite a provocating title I choose, Open Up or Close Down, as I want to take you on a journey of discovery, of finding out new creation, value creation patterns that are out there, business models, strategies of companies from a case analysis of about 30, 30 to 36 um, organizations that are out there that are working and running successfully. I choose three of them just to point out what they have in common. And what they have in common actually is that they to some extent rely on openness in their structures, in their processes, but also in terms of IP. But first, let me run you through the agenda quickly. Sorry. Okay, so I want to also use that chance to present where I come from, what we do, our university, and as it is not that well known throughout the journey. Then we have the three case studies. I want to find out what they have in common, and then go on with the concept of what I'm actually teach people. Uh, a model to describe those new patterns which we can observe. So let's start right away. So I come from the Helmut Schmidt University. Um, it's the University of the uh, German Armed Forces in Germany. So there are actually two of them. And I'm quite happy to see that both of the universities are represented at this conference. Yesterday with Professor Pickel from our sister university from Munich, and now I am from Hamburg. And I want to point out that as it is a university of the German Armed Forces, it doesn't mean that the research or the staff or something like that is military. So the basic thing that we are doing is that the study phase of officer candidates, who are almost exclusively our students, about 3,000 of them we have, as oh. Okay. Yes. So all the officer candidates have to run through a study phase where they do a civil degree. And the basic idea behind that is that after 13 years, usually a huge part of those officers leave the forces to work outside the forces as industry experts or in research, for example. Therefore, they need a civil school experience, study phase, and a civil degree to be competitive when they enter the civil uh, job market with uh, above 30 years or something like that. So this is our institute, and actually, as you can see, I come from the Institute of Production Engineering, which is rather engineering typically. But, and this is why I find this conference and the concept of the conference quite interesting, is the interdisciplinary uh, approach which, you, which we find here, and this is also what we do. So we have some topics that are really engineering, like robots, automation, or micro-manufacturing. But also, and this is where I come from, a small group of people who are pretty mixed up. So we have social scientists, we have economics, and also engineers who work on that or those topics. So we have knowledge management, uh, value creation patterns, crowdsourcing. And this is why we actually think this is a quite good idea. Also sometimes to talk with engineers from other, from other fields. But we are in the same group and therefore share our ideas and knowledge. And also I find out pretty interesting that some of the keywords which I shall use in the afterwards, um, I have already heard within that conference. So I've heard about, I've heard about co-creation. I've heard about interconnectedness. We've heard about knowledge sharing. These are actually all words which we will see in a second. So this just to let you know that we exist, that there is something in Germany which has to do with, with the army but has nothing to do with it like from the content, from the research. And uh, so now let's go into detail. I wonder if you know something like that still. 
an encyclopedia, and this is a, fir, uh, a very famous German one, or actually I have to say it has been a firm one. I don't know, has anyone within the last 10 years bought himself an encyclopedia? Oh really? <laughs> That's interesting. Um, I did not actually, but in Germany it was for over 200 years, those encyclopedia has existed. And people used to buy it on the one hand to show that they are well-educated people, but on the other hand to put it as furniture in your, <laughs> in your bookshelf and therefore show that you are a very educated um, person. But anyways, so this, um, this product, the Brockhaus, it has been there for 200 years and with the advent of the internet, the spread of the internet and the advent of Wikipedia, within a few years it just disappeared. It just disappeared. They also had an online encyclopedia, but even that had closed down within two years. And the question is why? So when I prepared the presentation and uh, wanted to, to come here, I thought, okay, I should uh, look up what again was a cybernetics and what were the basic ideas of it, as the conference also deals about cybernetics. So I thought, go the traditional way, but I don't have the encyclopedia, so I had to go to the library, which took some time, but then I could actually look up what, what the basic idea of cybernetics was. And then I said, okay, compared to Wikipedia, what is the difference then actually? And it's quite interesting to see. You can see the numbers over here. That for example, so the Brockhaus is also a German standard work, but it's just the German language actually. Probably only one author has actually made that article. And it has only five references, six tags, which you then by yourself have to, you know, look up uh, at another version of the 30 volume thick um, Brockhaus encyclopedia. So it's quite obvious to see that, I mean, updated here, the Wikipedia article in the English version has more than 300 authors with more than 24 references and tags, hyperlinks, which you can just run through. And this is just the basic answer, which I would say, actually, and Wikipedia is for free. So the Brockhaus actually costs you 3,000 euros. And this is quite ex expensive, I would say. So let's compare the two media. Brockhaus and Wikipedia, and again, with 200 plus languages, meanwhile, 33 million articles, and the number is increasing each month by 22,000. They have 70,000 active editors and authors also helping to increase the knowledge base which anyone on the world, wherever he has an access to an internet or a mobile device, can have access to for free. It's the seventh popular website and they have over 500 million views per month. So I think the answer is, uh, it's quite obvious why Brockhaus has not any chance to survive that. So this was the first, um, the first example and case where we can see that, okay, you could say, hmm, this is the media world, it's digital and it's the internet. Um, so we have a collaborative communication, we have users from all over the web collaborating. So could that also be applicable to the world of physical products? So I wanna go to the next uh, case study now. Oh, I'm sorry, which I forgot. It's quite a sad topic actually. You probably remember the terror attack uh, from January this year in France. But what I found really, really astonishing about Wikipedia again, have a look at that. The shooting started at 11.30, 11.50, the, case, the, the English page was created. And within one hour, people didn't even know what's going on. The shooting was going, nobody knew what happened. Within one hour, there was an article about 600 words, 20 references, and 20 users were doing 48 revisions on that article, within one hour. And I don't think that any classical media or one media company or newspaper would be able to aggregate those numbers of information and I mean, look at the latest version, 750 people with 4,000 edits. This is astonishing, I think. So I'm sorry, this was the first uh, case. Let's head into the second case where we are looking at the physical world of products as well. So you prob probably remember that situation from time to time when you think, ha, huh, I just had a great idea and wouldn't it be great if anybody would want to use that idea or would buy the product? So, but how could you bring your idea as a product idea to market? A few years ago, uh, you probably would have to go to an inventor fair or you would have to go to a, you have to start up your own company or you could try to sell it 
via a license, but therefore you would have to patent it. So all the ways are actually very expensive, they are risky, and they are time intensive. So you probably wouldn't do it if you have a regular job. But there's a company which actually is working on that, an invention company where the only thing that you have to do is submit your idea. And it's called Quirky. And what's interesting about Quirky, I don't know if you've heard about that American uh, company, what's interesting about that is that they, they get each month, each month, they get over 10,000 ideas submitted. 10,000 ideas. I wonder if any like, huge company from all over the world having an internal R&D section could generate that much ideas. You can just probably just f choose from. And also, they have a community of one million registered users. One million users who want to participate in the value creation process. We'll see that in a second how that works. So this is what they do. Once you're a user, you can either submit your idea or also be just part of the product development process of other projects being brought to life. So once you have an idea, you submit it with a draw or a sketch or just a project description. And anybody else, the community, has to vote on it if they like it or not. If they like it and it has a certain vote, it's going through the next stage, which is then a product evaluation by the Quirky community. They have a weekly ritual where they take all the great ideas they have, take them together with industry experts and their own engineers and marketing guys, and say, okay, this is worth giving it a try. If you lose, you get all the data that were collected and you can probably think about resubmitting your idea. If not, then it's going through the development process, which is also again done by quirky experts, but also the community. Anyone who want to, you don't have to be a professional expert on design or something like that. You can either really take part in the design process, hand in own sketches, or vote on existing ideas from other users. And again, there is a voting process going on. So then, the finalized product will be put on a pre-sale. They also have an online shop, and if enough of that community say, I would like to buy that product if it would be brought to life, then it's actually being produced. Then, Quirky has three ways to sell the product, actually. Via their own online shop, or via direct sales with uh, partners, which they have like uh, Home Depot or Walmart or something like that. And also, uh, meanwhile, they changed their, um, their uh, strategy a bit that they said they have uh, retail partners um, all over the world. So you can actually also now in Germany buy the products from Quirky. And then what <coughs> happens is not only you as the idea submitter get cash, but also any one of the community who somehow influenced the development of the product. So how is that going on? So if every product they sell, the product revenues go to a certain share in form of a royalty pie from between two, uh, three to 10% uh, of the sales revenues will be, so this is then the pie of that three to 10% will be given back to the community. And here's the share. You that submitted the idea gets 40% of that pie. And also anyone else, which could also be you if the idea was good enough, will be rewarded as part of this share. And this is quite interesting, I, I would say, as a, as, a business, as a business model. So how could that actually then look? Um, look at that guy. He invented nothing but a flexible power surge, uh, which is, I don't know, a basic idea, but actually brought to life. Not too bad. You can actually use it and bend it. And meanwhile, 600,000 of this were sold, and that guy actually earned $600,000 with that. Just the product, and he just sent it in the idea. Also interesting that over 1,000 people, so-called influencers from the community, participated in the development of the product, and therefore also got rewarded. So this was the second case where I want to show that also in the world of physical products, aspects of international or global collaboration in the form of uh, a community can work and as part of a business model like Quirky is doing it, is worth considering for other businesses and industries as well. Now coming to the third case. You probably remember a more, even more traditional 
industry like the car industry, over 150 years, very traditional, huge companies. And back in the old days, it looked like something like that. At the Ford company, you had the fully integrated company where one company, in this case Ford, had full control over the whole value creation process. Of course, these days that's not anymore the case, but still, usually you have one focal big player, Toyota, Volkswagen, GM, whatever it may be, which has control of the value creation process, although it's not happening within their border of a company anymore. Still, they have the control over it. But could you think of a way also producing and selling and assembling cars in a totally new way, which relates to aspects which I have already mentioned? And that's what Local Motors is doing. They are building their cars in something like that where you would say, ha, huh, that's probably not the most professional way, I would say. Doesn't look like, at least. But what they actually work on are so-called microfactories, which they run throughout the country, where people who order the car can either let it assemble there, or, and this is where it comes, the, the next idea of co-creation, you as the, the buyer can actually go there and assemble it together with their staff mechanics assemble your own car and drive away with it after two weekends of work. You can actually bring your friends, make it a nice event. And this is what Local Motors is doing. This was the first car that, that they developed. And now look at those numbers. Usually traditional car makers, it takes up, up to six years until they bring to life and on the street a new model. This car took them about six months with the community, six months for development and two years and then they brought it to life, two years. Of course, you would say this is not a mass uh, product. It's probably not um, working in Europe where we have high restrictions from safety issues, whatever. But the basic idea that it's possible to develop a car like that, the, sh the chassis, the design, was all set up with competition. Well, not competition, a competition within the community where anyone, designers, engineers, but also hobby and amateurs could uh, hand in their ideas and therefore be part of the value creation process. Look at that. By development of the car, this is what uh, competitors with other models uh, took them. So it's just a tiny share of cost which they actually have as they are enhancing and harnessing this huge crowd effect. It's faster than any other one and that's just the answer. More than 50,000 people, experts, designers, engineers, walk, working voluntarily and for free. So this is a huge resource which you can actually harness as a company. Again, this is how they do it. It's kind of the same way. They have a platform, they have a community, and they have a process. So their idea is probably more the management of the community, which is kind of their business model. And again, they help the, the users who hand in ideas but any other organization as well could there set a project idea and let the community develop uh, solutions where they can vote on, so the community votes on the, the, the product which finally wins. And again, there is then a prize which is set before where people could get money from it, but I think in the first place it's not the money why they want to join the community. There are other things, intrinsic motivation aspects which have to be considered. And again, they have the micro manufacturing system and also have an online shop where you can actually buy the cars. And even more, there was the, uh, the Ministry of Defense setting out a challenge throughout the community where they said, okay, we want to have a prototype for a new car um, for our army. And within three and a half months, they were able to deliver a prototype of a car which now is being further developed by the defense industry. But anyway, three and a half months, and they had this prototype ready, handed it over to President Obama. And this is just astonishing, as I think. And again, another project. They set a, a project idea where they said, we want to produce a car which is mainly produced on additive manufactured technologies, for example, 3D printing. This was the design that actually won the competition. And on this year's 
um, Consumer Electronics Fair in, uh, in uh, Las Vegas, I think it was, um, they actually printed that car within 44 hours, set it up with some wheels, some chairs, and put in a motor, and then the CEO of the company drove away at the conference. You can actually buy this thing um, within a half a year or something like that. It should be available for about $20,000. Uh, it doesn't look too beautiful or rather special, I would say, but the idea is great. So this is basically, for all cases, the idea why it works better than having your own people do it, because you probably wouldn't have the smartest, smartest people at all. They work for someone else. So you should try to weigh to think of ways how you can actually make use of those people. So what do they have in common? Just representative for a whole bunch of cases where companies set their strategy to openness or harness business models which are based on openness. We have effects like a producer um, or a prosumer. So this is the right way to spell it. It's a, produ produ uh, a producer on the one hand, but on the other hand, he's the consumer or he's a producer and a user of a company. So, so the, the domains of produ production and consumption are dissolving. It's about the same. And this is then what you actually call co-creation. It's not value creation top down from one company, a company providing a product to the market. No, it's a rather a co-creation aspect. Also, those organizations, no, not the organization, but the community, it's self-organizing. You cannot control it. And, for example, as in Wikipedia, it's a mon non-monetary participation. They don't expect money. There is something else which they want. Also, knowledge sharing is a basic idea. So, for example, Local Motors has put all that data and documentation, it's all open source. You can go on the website, log into their community, and have a look inside all drawings, all construction data, and actually modify it, advance it. So in the precondition, for those rather modern companies and business models, we think is a certain degree of openness. You have to be open in terms of structures, processes, um, in order to let other people in, share knowledge, and therefore, again, be more efficient in putting products to life, giving products the chance to come to life, after all. So this is a, a very inter interesting thing which is going on right now. And the question is now, traditional models and concepts actually cannot describe that, that paradigm shift from value, co no, from value creation to value co-creation. And the basic idea is that, as I already mentioned, in the traditional view it was that the whole value chain was within the sphere of influence of one company or at least one producer. The value creation artifact can be related to the product, but as the product itself, is, it's, it's, it's not enough to, to talk about a product. We are also talking about services and we are talking about products which in the meantime adding up their intangible aspects. So we have more software, more information within products. Therefore, to take that into account, we talk about an artifact. And this is what's happening these days. This is what we call bottom-up economics. We have self-organizing uh, groups or communities. And the most interesting thing is that the producer or the company, which is later on selling the product, it's not controlling or above the value creation system, it is an essential part of it. But all actors in that uh, area are equal. It's the consumer or producer and are other actors which might also be part of that value creation process. And therefore, there is a whole sphere. The borders are actually dissolving of companies, companies' walls, and uh, there's something going on out there. So to sum it up, We've seen that new value creation patterns based on collaboration and co-creation that reach beyond the company's border can be observed. With an increasing influence of information and communication technologies, um, you can say that organizations that consider bottom-up economics in their strategy, in their product development, throughout their whole value chain, they can be more innovative and also more efficient 
but in the end, more successful than traditional companies. In this context, we would then say that openness is a key aspect and is regarded as a critical factor in that manner. Again, organizations are part of a system but cannot control it. They are essential part of it. Thus, the ability to effectively and efficiently manage those uh, interactions, communications, but co cooperations is about to become at least as important as traditional competitive factors like cost leadership, anything that's going on uh, at the moment or has been for the last 20 years. So in the future, those companies will be successful who share their knowledge, at least a part of it. So we wouldn't say that anyone has to go open and just share all of its basic knowledge, which is, which is probably his, his, own, um, his own competitive advantage. But you have to think about where you could open up and therefore um, harness new aspects of collaboration throughout um, the internet, the community. You should foster participation throughout your whole value chain. There are concepts out there. Um, have to make use of it internally and externally. So also your own employees have to be prepared. They have to be managed in a manner which allows them to work collaboratively. You should strengthen your ability to cooperate and develop new business models with respect to those ideas. I'll go a bit more into detail with the concepts in the breakout session. I would be very happy to see some of you over there. And thank you for your attention. And I'll be open for uh, any questions if I can answer them. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>